Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this live stream. Uh, my name's Ash. I work in David Limbrick's electorate office. My role today will be as a moderator and handling the questions and answers. So if you have questions that come up during the conversation or things you really want answered, post them in the live stream and uh, I'll be checking that throughout the live stream. If you don't want to post them publicly, you can also message David's inbox and we'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Joining us today is David Limbrick, a Liberal Democrats member for the Southeast Metropolitan Region of the Legislative Council in Victoria. That's uh, the Upper House. We have um, Professor Gigi Foster, a Professor of Economics at the University of New South Wales with a research background in behavioural economics, education economics and Australian policy. And we have joining us from New Zealand, Dr. Simon Thornley, a public health physician and a lecturer and researcher in the fields of epidemiology and biostatistics. And just a disclaimer as well, um, Professor Foster and Dr. Thornley are here representing themselves today. They're not representing their institutions. So to get us started, David, would you like to um, introduce the live stream and what we're trying to do here by bringing these experts together to answer some questions? Thanks a lot, Ash. And I'd, I'd really like to thank uh, Gigi and Simon for coming along today and also the viewers who've uh, taken some time out on their Saturday afternoon to tune in. So for some time I've had concerns about the government's uh, response to the pandemic in Victoria and, and more generally in Australia, I suppose. Um, when the pandemic first hit in Victoria, we were given this um, pretty reasonable response, I, I think, in lots of ways. Um, you know, the government said, okay, we need uh, a bit of time to upgrade our medical system, uh, to upgrade the capacity, to get in uh, equipment and, and uh, workers and all this sort of thing. And the, the big messaging was around flattening the curve. And the idea was that, um, you know, we would uh, slow down the, the spread of the virus to buy a bit of time so that um, we wouldn't outstrip the capacity of our medical system. And no one wants, you know, people who need medical treatment to not be able to get it. So that seemed like a reasonable thing. Um, but what we've seen uh, beyond that is uh, a whole bunch of things that have gone in different directions and some of the, the harms that the actions that the government has taken in terms of lockdowns and things like this, there's questions around um, whether these harms uh, are worse than other actions that the government could have been taking. And one thing that I've noticed and lots of people have noticed is that people who are questioning the government's response and challenging some of these things, um, I don't think their voices are being uh, heard enough. And this is why I've uh, invited Professor Foster and Dr Thornley along today, because I've heard, heard them and their arguments and they have different views to some other people that are talking about this at the moment. And I think even if people uh, disagree with their views, what's important is to uh, engage with these views. And this is something that's been lacking, I think. People have just been uh, attacked and haven't been, their arguments haven't been challenged and engaged with properly, I think. And that's why I wanted to have this discussion today. Thanks, David. And uh, Gigi, could you uh, tell us a little bit about your background um, so, so the audience understands who you are, please? Sure. So uh, you may hear from my accent that I was born in the United States and uh, had my education there. I studied as an undergraduate ethics, politics and economics, so not a straight economics degree. And I think that broad education is largely what informs a lot of my work today. And then my PhD is in economics uh, from the University of Maryland. I moved over to Australia in 2003. So I've been here for 17 years. I'm a dual citizen of the US and Australia. And my research is in a variety of areas. I've, um, I've done a lot of different types of research with administrative data, uh, experimental data, uh, more theoretical pieces, and um, in the areas of behavioral economics and education uh, economics particularly, but also time use, um, Australian policy generally. And I also do a lot of engagement with the media. So I have a, a national radio program with Peter Martin as my co-host at the ABC. Um, and I, I generally uh, you know, also do regular teaching as, as most uh, academic staff do. And I'm actually the director of education right now for the School of Economics at UNSW as well as doing uh, teaching for myself. So, so I kind of am a standard academic. Thanks, Gigi. Uh, Simon, could you please introduce yourself and a little bit about your background? 
Sure, thanks, Ash. Um, I'm a medically trained doctor, uh, born and bred in Auckland, New Zealand, and uh, worked in the hospitals as a medical registrar in Auckland and a little bit in the Hunter Valley over in Australia. Um, and then I really got into interested in public health, trained in epidemiology, um, been working in uh, public health as their epidemiologist predicting uh, the course of outbreaks like measles. I have an interest uh, particularly at the moment uh, on uh, scabies and rheumatic fever which is actually the ideas have all come from you guys uh, particularly in the Northern Territory uh, and uh, also had a heavy interest in dietary things, but uh, interested in biostatistics and uh, uh, until very recently had been working uh, with the local public health unit with their response to the COVID uh, pandemic. And as you might have seen, uh, just during the pandemic, um, became clear to me that the government's response was an overreaction and so I published a uh, op-ed in the local newspaper and subsequently formed a group called COVID Plan B, uh, where we've been advocating for a different response for the government. Thanks for that, Simon. Um, I think it might be helpful at this stage um, to kind of define some terms, because uh, as academics, um, I guess you guys use some specific language and tools in the work that you do. So maybe if we start with Gigi, could you explain exactly what economists like you do when um, making recommendations or analysis of policy, particularly health policy, what, what the goal is of an economist who advises on policy and um, exactly what are statistical life years, quality adjusted life years and well-being years and why are they important in understanding our response? Sure. So the first part of your question is, is especially important to understand. And I think economics has not a great um, reputation in this country, maybe in New Zealand as well. I'm not sure. Um, I think a lot of people believe that the goal of economists in, in recommending policies is to maximize material uh, wealth, money or, or something to do with that, um, stock prices or, or, or profits. And, and that's not true. So economics is a social science. And its ultimate goal is to maximize total human welfare. So when we give advice on policy, we're giving advice with the goal of setting up a scenario in our societies such that given the way that people really behave and the way that um, resources are distributed and everything else, we predict that we're going to get the highest welfare for everybody. And that means that we are considering not just welfare from COVID-19, for example, or not just from scabies or not just from measles, but welfare relating to every other type of thing that can make people you know, sick or well. Now, how we measure that, that sickness or wellness is the second part of your question. And so there are three sort of standard and particularly two really standard ways of doing this. And a third that has been added just recently, very, very uh, serendipitously as it turns out. So the first two more standard ones, one is the value of a statistical life year. And that's a number that is used when determining, for example, um, environmental policy regulation settings or um, policy on um, you know, things that are maybe about traffic safety, for example, um, that affect the entire population. And there we want to know what is a, a typical life sort of worth and we back that out by people's real choices. So if you imagine having two people um, who are identical, which we couldn't do, of course, but this is the thought experiment, two people who are identical and one of them takes a job that is slightly less risky than the other one. And the person who's taking the riskier job expects to have a bit of a financial compensation for that. That difference in the wage that would be willing to be accepted by the, the same person in these two different jobs, that is used as the fundamental driver and the, the impetus to um, be able to create a value of a statistical life year. So it's the implicit value of life that people place upon their own lives when making choices. So that number is usually somewhere in the millions, um, two million to five million-ish. So that's the first thing that's used. Now that's not used to make wholesale health policy decisions, generally speaking, in developed countries like Australia. The number that's used or the currency that's used there is quality adjusted life years. 
And the quality adjusted life year is a, a figure that is one if you're if you have a perfectly healthy year for one person, and uh, less than that to the extent that the person is suffering. So if you have a disability of some sort, or if you have depression, then that number will come down. So a life, a one year of life with uh, depression, for example, I think is something like 0.8 of a quality. So qualities are used by, for example, the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and other kinds of national um, resource allocation decision uh, making bodies in Australia and overseas to decide when to buy a particular new drug or a new intervention to try to save lives. So generally speaking, in Australia and other countries, the, the, there's a threshold cost that we are willing to pay for the benefit of having one quality more um, from a drug or, a, or an intervention. And that cost is usually somewhere between $50,000 and $150,000. So maybe $100,000. Um, $100,000 is actually very generous. So oftentimes we're only using maybe more like $50,000. But there's a, there's a dollar figure that we place upon that quality. And that then allows us to make those kinds of resource allocation decisions. Because of course, economics amongst all the social sciences recognizes that resources are scarce. And when we allocate them to one cause, we are not allocating them at the same time to another cause. Now, the third and more recent development in terms of currencies in which to measure human suffering is the well being, and that's the well being year. And that's a little more difficult to get your head around, but it's essentially based on a question that's very common in surveys in Australia and overseas, which asks overall, how satisfied are you with your life? And that is answered on a scale of zero to 10. Now, in most countries like Australia, the average person will answer that question uh, with a number of maybe between six and eight, something like that. Um, and usually in those countries as well, if you get down below about three, like if you get to two, then most people would consider that almost not worth living when you have that low of a life satisfaction. Now, a well be, a well being year, is one point on that scale, on that zero to 10 scale of life satisfaction for a year experienced by a person. So that means that essentially it's able to be translated into qualities at a, uh, an exchange rate. Right? And that exchange rate in the literature is usually somewhere between six and eight. I've used six in, in the calculations that I've recently done for the Victorian Public Accounts and Estimates Committee. So once you have those currencies in your mind, you're able then to try to uh, accommodate all different aspects of the human suffering and, and human health that are um, created when we embark upon a particular policy direction. And that's what economists try to do. And what they would do in this crisis, um, I, I, I've honestly been very surprised that, that not so many, <laughs> very few economists have actually come to the table, come out of the woodwork and, and been uh, talking about this in the public sphere because it is the bread and butter of um, cost benefit analysis and a lot of applied uh, economic policy analysis. Thanks, Gigi. Um, Simon, so in epidemiology, we hear of terms like uh, case fatality rate, infection fatality rate, you know, PCR testing, serology. Could you maybe explain um, what these terms mean? Sure. Well, I think the first first one there, the case fatality ratio, is uh, the ratio of the number of deaths to the number of cases that have been detected. Um, and obviously, you know, with testing, testing is dependent on many things. You know, how how, how much the population decides to go out and get tested and whether they do or not. And I think there's been some incentives not to get a test in, in some areas of the world. Um, and and uh, so the infection fatality ratio is a kind of a slightly more fair figure that we're after, which is the ratio of deaths to the number of infections. And so that is used when there's a new virus comes along it's the the main issue and the the burning issue in the mind of an epidemiologist is what is the infection fatality ratio and usually it's de defined early on from the case fatality ratio which is the number of cases uh, sorry the number of deaths to the number of cases often that's a high number because it's only been the new virus has only been discovered in, in hospitalized cases and it takes some time for it to get uh, uh, more tests uh, done in the community. Um, and uh, initially, they're usually heavily symptomatic people. Uh, quite early in the 
piece with COVID, it was found that it was not only symptomatic people, but also asymptomatic people were testing positive. So this case fatality ratio was very high initially. Just look at the hospitalized cases and then it's progressively dropped. So that uh, brings us on to how are cases defined? Um, how do you become a case? And probably most people are familiar with the idea of PCR now. Um, PCR is polymerase chain reaction and that uh, it's a revolutionary um, tool for uh, diagnosis of particularly infectious diseases. Um, swab put up uh, the back of the nose and basically it's, it's like looking for a particular sentence in an Encyclopedia Britannica which is uh, the genetics genetic material um, on the swab. Uh, so uh, that particular sentence is specific to a particular germ or a virus. And in this case, it's uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, which in cases are known as COVID-19. So that tells you whether there's virus in the body and that virus can be active, it can be causing symptoms or it actually can be an activated virus and you can still get positive tests and not be actually shedding the virus um, and uh, just going on from that uh, if we've had the virus and we've recovered from it and there's no more virus in our body then our PCR test will be negative um, but it uh, generally, there is a sign of that infection left, which is the body's response, the immune response to the virus. And the most well-known and the, the, the thing that everyone tends to know about is antibodies. And we call and the sort of general term is serology. Um, and antibodies are a blood test and there was some questions early on about how accurate these antibody tests were. Now, um, most of the big manufacturers, the accuracy of these tests is very good. Um, and uh, so that's been a discovery pretty early on in the phase of COVID was that um, all the tests initially were from the PCR test. Um, but when uh, blood was drawn, and uh, people were sampled, uh, the proportion of the population that was infected was much higher. And it was a familiar story from the swine flu days back in 2009. Um, so I hope that sort of covers some of the, the, the jargon that, that we tend to use. Thanks, Simon. Um, David, I think uh, we, you know, we're here broadcasting from Victoria. Um, could you maybe give us a, a bit of a rundown of the political response? You know, what mechanisms have people been using? Um, and I am keeping an eye on your questions there for the audience, so please keep them coming. Uh, possibly one that you could answer within that is um, what are the measures that the government are using to force business and people to comply? Okay, so <clears throat> back in uh, March, the government... Uh, invoked uh, uh, what's called a uh, public health emergency in under the uh, Public Health and Wellbeing Act legislation. And so what that allows the government to do is to control uh, people's movements, to um, in some cases force people to do tests and things like this, although they haven't been doing that a lot, um, and do things like order businesses to close down and this sort of thing. And this legislation was brought in back in 2008, I think it was. It was actually brought in by Daniel Andrews himself when he was health minister, uh, interestingly, in, interestingly enough. Um, but the legislation allows a, a state of emergency to be declared for up to one month, and then that can be extended for up to a, a total period of up to six months. And so um, that period the maximum extension actually finishes on September 13th. So if the government wants to continue that state of emergency, um, they will need either new legislation or something else. We don't actually know what the government plans to do after September 13th just yet. In addition to that, 
Um, they've also recently, uh, in earlier this month, uh, declared a state of disaster, which is separate legislation, which allows them to do different things. Um, so some of the things that the government wanted to do weren't actually possible under the state of emergency. And we wondered um, back when the state of emergency was declared what they were going to do when they got close to the end of six months. Um, and maybe they might declare a disaster, which is what they've done. Um, but one of the things, to give you an example of some of the things that can be done under the state of disaster is they've uh, the curfews were done uh, using that legislation. But the disaster declaration allows the government to selectively uh, suspend acts of parliament. So they can selectively suspend existing uh, legislation for a limited period of time. The other thing that they did uh, early on was there was a COVID omnibus bill. Um, and this was like another temporary uh, bit of legislation that allowed things like you know, parliament committees and councils and things like this to meet remotely. And there's a whole bunch of things in there that it allowed um, allowed different agencies to, to do and to continue operations and things around courts operating and video conferencing and things like this. We didn't have a lot of concerns with that particular piece of legislation. Our main concern was always with the um, state of emergency. And so what we saw, like I said earlier, um, you know, the government had pretty good communications early on, in my opinion, you know, they talked about flattening the curve and why they needed to do that. They needed to buy some time and this sort of thing. And then what we saw after that, though, was that, okay, they upgraded the uh, medical capacity, um, the system capacity, they did flatten the curve, and all of these things. And yet, we still had continued uh, ongoing restrictions. And then there was a lot of concern from people, including myself in Parliament, about how we're going to have scrutiny over the government. And there was uh, a number of attempts to set up a various inquiries that weren't controlled by the government. Um, they, two of those attempts failed. Um, what the government did do, though, is they allowed an, an inquiry into the government's response to the pandemic to be set up and they allowed one extra um, member to be added to that committee. So this is using the Public Accounts and Estimates Committee. Um, unfortunately, it's still controlled by the government, but um, I was very keen to ensure scrutiny of the government's response, which is why I fought very hard to get onto that committee and I ended up getting uh, elected to that committee. And so we've had a few committee uh, hearing, public hearings and submissions and things like that that have happened recently. And um, uh, Gigi was actually a witness at one of those hearings and presented some evidence, but we've had lots of different people, including ministers. But we've seen um, there were some mistakes uh, around quarantine, clearly. So the government set up another inquiry to look at what happened in quarantine. And there was an increase in the number of infections. And so the government's locked down very, very hard at the moment. We're in what's called stage four restrictions, which means we can't go outside except for very... Uh, certain circumstances. We need permits to go to work. Um, we have a curfew after 8 p.m. Um, most businesses have been forcibly shut down one way or another. Uh, schools are shut down. People are learning. Uh, children have been learning from home for months now. Um, and what I've seen and what lots of other people seen, I mean, the, the pain is clear to everyone, right? Um, uh, you know, I get calls into my office of all sorts of horrible stories about um, what have hap what has happened to people's lives, their businesses, their mental health, and all these other things. So I think it's undeniable that the government's actions have caused harm. And this is the real question: is have they struck the right balance here? And th this is the the critical question that we're trying to uh, have the discussion about: is whether we think that that balance is actually right. Um, I might just come back to David with a quick question before hmm. we jump back to our other guests. Uh, a few people have mentioned in the comments um, about the ex expiration of the state of emergency yes. and whether that can be extended and um, if so, the mechanism, how can that be prevented? So could you talk about that a little bit? please? Yeah, so it expires in September, on the 13th of September. Uh, it can't be extended under the existing legislation. Um, there may be means to extend it that I'm not aware of, um, but 
the main means that by which you would extend it is to put up another bill in Parliament and have Parliament vote on that new legislation, which would amend the existing legislation. I've stated quite clearly, I'm not going to support any extension of the emergency powers. Um, my feeling on the emergency powers is that the whole point of limiting six months is to give the government some space to develop a means of dealing with an emergency that is compatible with a liberal democracy and then go back to doing that after that period's expired. Um, I don't, I'm not willing to uh, extend these very severe powers that the government seems to be totally depending on. Um, I, I think that they, they need to look at a, a different approach and I won't be supporting extensions to that. However, the disaster declaration is still in effect. Um, they could transfer some of the powers that they want to use into the disaster declaration, or there could be other means that they're planning that I just don't know about yet. So we don't know. But under the existing legislation, they can't extend the state of emergency, but the state of disaster would still be in effect. Thanks, David. Um, Gigi, after your Q&A appearance, um, you copped a lot of criticism on social media. Um, and this is something that we've seen, and I'll, I'll come to Simon after, after Gigi. Um, essentially, people that do have a critique of the current response, uh, it's assumed that they want to let it rip, and that um, essentially the, the phrase that's being used is that you just want to kill grandma. So I guess, do you want to kill grandma? And, um, you know, what, what, what is your actual uh, opinion of um, how to best approach <laughs> Um, well, I, I, I'm not even sure I should uh, entertain that question, but I mean, I have an 89 year old father in New York State and, you know, obviously I don't want him to get COVID <laughs> right? and, and we, we want to arrange the society in Australia such that the people who are most likely to suffer serious consequences from this disease are the ones who are least likely to get it. And, in other areas of our policy making, we adopt a targeted approach. So for example, in, in our tax and transfer policies here, in welfare policies here, we give welfare support to families who need that support for various reasons, unemployment or um, abuse in the home or you know, need of childcare, et cetera, et cetera. So we have targeted policies to help people who need it. And in this present scenario, unfortunately, there's been a, a kind of a binary um, fabrication of, of the options available to us. It is not simply we have either a total lockdown or whatever let it rip means. I, I don't even really know what that means because I think that's just um, this, this kind of boogeyman image of everybody going about their lives as they normally would, even if, you know, as if, as if COVID-19 were not around. We know people are going to voluntarily adopt measures to protect themselves or their loved ones if they've got people uh, in their lives who are elderly or immunocompromised or if they themselves are elderly or immunocompromised. Um, people won't be that stupid. <laughs> so th there will be protective measures adopted by individuals. So the question is really along the spectrum of doing nothing to full lockdown, where is the best place for the government to be? And when I say best, I mean maximal welfare achieving. Right, total maximum human welfare achieving place to be. And, and that's a question that just doesn't seem to be asked in the political circles. And I find it very disturbing because, I mean, again, as an economist, I, I would hope that the policies that the governments decide upon in a democracy are taken uh, for the benefit of the people, <laughs> maximizing the benefit that, that those policies will achieve for the people. And, and that kind of analysis to determine that that's where we are just hasn't happened. So, um, so yes, I, I, I don't wanna kill granny. I, I want the government to use its scarce resources in the most effective way to prevent as many deaths as we can, um, to, to maximize the welfare we're going to get out of this. Now, it's clear that in a COVID-19 world, we're gonna have less welfare than we have in a non-COVID-19 world, right? The introduction of COVID-19 into the, you know, into the mix of things that are circulating means we're going to have less welfare any way you cut it, no matter what the government does. So what we are looking for is the least worst option. And my feeling is that the government should have 
um, been much more targeted in its approach from the very beginning. And it should have also controlled the fear response rather than stoking the fear response, which is mainly what we've seen. It should have controlled and directed the fear towards, towards general welfare losses rather than just COVID-19 losses. So, so that's the sort of uh, place I think I would like the government to move to. And then the question is how to help it to do that. Thanks, Gigi. Um, Simon, have, have you caught similar criticism in New Zealand for, I guess, uh, having opinions that aren't the status quo? And um, I guess, you know, what data are you looking at to uh, suggest that the lockdowns aren't working and what might be a better approach? Sure, yeah. Well, I guess, uh, you know, I've, yeah, um, had a lot of criticism on social media. Um, so a lot of criticism from my colleagues who are pretty heavily invested in the government's response. I guess uh, my views were quite heavily tampered by the response to H1N1 swine flu back in 2009. And I was training in public health at the time and part of the public health response. And we were trying to eliminate the virus uh, tooth and nail, doing everything we could, dishing out lots of Tammy flu. Um, and then we did a zero survey, and that was a very surprising result from that zero survey, because just as we were trying to eliminate, and we think we're on top of things, zero survey came back and showed that 30% of New Zealanders had had the virus, and we hadn't actually known about it. Um, and basically, the wind went, blew out of the sails to do anything about uh, H1N1, that was really the end of it. Um, so when uh, COVID came along, um, I it was fresh in my memory, that experience. And I assumed that the government had learned from that and a zero survey looking at antibodies and the body responses and, and dialing back the fatality rates that we've talk, been talking about, which for H1N1 had been astronomical initially when just cases around the hospital had been looked at. And that w never happened. And actually the government in New Zealand, I'm not sure what the Australians have been doing, but they've actually banned uh, the importation of serology tests. So there's companies around that have serology tests kicking around and they actually want them to be used the government's telling them that they can't. Um, so other facts seem to um, be pertinent that the average age of death of COVID cases was about 82. And uh, our life expectancy is 82. So that means half of us are dead by 82. And actually, if you look at the statistical distribution of age uh, of COVID deaths. I actually just looked at Victoria's age distribution of COVID deaths and it looks exactly the same as New Zealand's and I compared New Zealand's to the age distribution of COVID deaths the year before and it's exactly the same. You do a statistical test, you won't see a difference. So uh, you, you, this question of how much life is being lost to COVID-19 is important because what we're seeing is very simple case numbers, very simple, simple numbers of deaths. And uh, this question that I think Gigi's been asking about quality adjusted life years, uh, years of life lost from the virus is actually very low. Um, and uh, like David, you know, I was very supportive of the government's initial goals to protect the health system and that there would be enough beds in intensive care that the hospitals wouldn't be overwhelmed. But we know in New Zealand anyway, and I have some contacts in Victoria, and I think that the story has been the same, is that the health system was never overwhelmed. And the goalposts for locking down the community just shifted from uh, save the hospital to go hard and early was the catchphrase in New Zealand. 
And now there's been a case of, uh, you know, this, uh, there's been a story of elimination of the virus in New Zealand. And now with a new spate of community transmission of the virus, so cases not associated with uh, flying into the country, uh, then we, we've been locked down for the last couple of weeks. So, yeah, I, um, when you, you look at the seriousness of the virus from an epidemiological point of view, you do get underwhelmed, uh, and particularly when you see the scaremongering in the media on a daily basis. And there's a much more complicated, nuanced story to these figures. And in terms of, uh, I think, your question, Ash, about what should we be doing, it was clear to me early on, and from, from what we know about other coronaviruses, that they cause mayhem in uh, where people are frail and elderly and on the edge. And so that's rest homes and that's hospitals. And I think one thing New Zealand has done pretty well, actually, which is, uh, I think, probably kept our statistics down more so, much more so than lockdowns, is uh, infection control around rest homes and hospitals and separating COVID-19 cases from other cases. It's been clear that in some parts of the world, such as uh, Italy, the UK, and New York, uh, they've actually been discharging convalescing patients from hospital into rest homes, and the virus is spread through rest homes. If you look internationally, about half of cases, uh, half of fatalities from COVID-19 have been in rest homes. Um, people living in rest homes. So to me, that was with the Plan B group, that was always the, uh, the priority was protecting the frail and elderly in rest homes and hospitals. And uh, actually young people uh, or people of working age, I uh, still consider myself young, I suppose, um, <laughs> actually a very low risk of fatality from the virus. And so why New Zealand was l shutting schools and uh, keeping uh, people who are at extremely low risk away from work just didn't seem logical to me. Thanks for that, Simon. Um, I guess... I guess for all of the guests, maybe um, it would be helpful to examine, um, I guess, the, the counterbalancing facts of like, what, what exactly are the harms of the, the lockdown? Um, maybe if we start with David, I know you've been receiving a lot of correspondence from people that are um, experiencing these harms. Yeah, so, um... <clears throat> The harms, I mean, everyone's feeling these harms <laughs> to some degree, but I mean, I have my, the harm that I was most concerned about early on and that I'm still concerned about is the mental health and disruption to education of children. Um, it's, I've, I've got three children of my own young boys. I've seen very, very negative effects on them. And, you know, it, they're probably in the perfect uh, situation, right? Where they've got their dad's still got a job, um, mum's at home looking after the kids. Um, you know, we've got a backyard. Um, you know, it's fairly stable family and all of that sort of thing. It's the perfect situation, and they're having trouble. And so I, I feel, you know, people who've got, you know, parents who've lost their jobs, or they're trying to work from home, or they've got unstable family situations, or they live in a flat and they don't have a backyard and this sort of thing. I just think that the, the effect on children must be absolutely awful and you know they can't see their friends you know kids are social and they want to they want to play with their friends and all this sort of stuff and to have them you know like I had a birthday party yesterday with one of my children and like it's just you can't do it you know can't have their friends and stuff you try and do your best but I mean you know lots of children are having like virtual birthday parties I've seen a virtual birthday party where all the kids were crying and stuff because they wanted to meet and it was just it's just absolutely horrible 
on top of that, you know, people are losing their businesses and jobs. You know, I've seen people that have spent, you know, huge parts of their life developing successful businesses, you know, restaurants and, and, and all sorts of businesses to, to cater to the community and provide good to the world and provide jobs and make everyone better off. And they're just stomped by the government, you know, through no fault of their own. They're, they're just, they're, they're good people and, and they've lost their business. They've had to sack workers, you know, and for any business owner that's had to sack people because of that sort of situation, it's absolutely brutal. And, you know, a lot of these people are having terrible mental health issues. Um, the physical aspects of locking people inside for such a long period of time, you know, we probably don't even know what sort of harms we're doing, but, you know, I know myself, I'm putting on a bit of weight. I'm sure lots of other people are. But I mean, you know, if you're just not going outside and doing exercise and normal things, I mean, but there's other harms as well. And I think Gigi alluded to this, the idea of, um, you know, opportunity cost. You know, there's things that we're spending all of these re medical resources and money on now. You know, is that the best way to, you know, if, if I give someone a million dollars and say, your goal is to maximize the health of as many people as you can with that million dollars. Are we going to be doing what we're doing here or are we going to be doing something else? I mean, this, this is a very valid question and it's like this unseen harm by all the things that aren't happening that should be happening. You know, things like new drug development or new medical services or education campaigns or whatever it might be. Um, these things aren't happening. We're putting all everything into COVID-19 and, and as Simon and Gigi have said that and as we've observed we've invested massive amounts into expanding our um, medical system capacity and we're not using it like it's just sitting there a lot of it I mean there's a lot of workers that are working very hard at the moment but a lot of this extra equipment and beds and all that is just simply not being used and, you know that's a good thing I mean I don't want it to be used but it's also waste right so we have to think about this sort of waste and also with the research side of things, so like everything's being pumped into COVID research. You know, they, they've got uh, God knows how many vaccine candidates that they're all researching and developing at the moment. And, you know, that's great if we get a vaccine, wonderful. But all these other drugs that they could have been developing are not happening because of that. So, I mean, and I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure Gigi and Simon could elaborate on a whole bunch of other harms that I haven't even touched on. But I mean, I think it's just scratching the surface. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, Gigi, do you want to talk about um, some of those harms? And I guess, you know, what does that mean in terms of the ones that you can count and look at data on as opposed to things that might be a little bit more abstract? Yeah, so that's been a, a real interesting part of this is trying to communicate to people about the, the costs. Um, it's, it's very difficult because some of the costs, in fact, a large amount of them are quite unseen as David alluded to. But there are some that are now, after you know, six months of living with the thing, becoming more visible, and not just based on data here in Australia, but based on data from other countries that have been actually collecting, in large case, in a lot of cases, better data than what we have had here. And what David has talked about in relation to the mental health costs, those, I think, are the, the most obvious, immediate, and direct effects of the wholesale lockdowns themselves. Um, it's very hard to argue that, you know, if we hadn't locked people down, that they would be feeling this sort of isolation and loneliness, um, that the children's birthday party scenario, uh, that, that just wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been locking down. Now, one of the interesting comments I've gotten sometimes from people is, well, fair enough, but we would have also had an economic recession anyway, because everybody was so scared that they wouldn't have gone out to the restaurants, they wouldn't have gone out to the cinemas, they would have tried to work from home more, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, that the counterfactual was a scenario in which there was already going to be some economic costs here. Um, and maybe that would also include some mental stress. And of course, that's possible. Um, and so that's why in the cost benefit analysis that I submitted as supplementary material to my testimony to the PIAC, which is now, by the way, available for free public download from the, uh, from the Victorian Parliament's website, I assumed that only half of the economic costs that we've been uh, seeing and that we're projecting now for this year and, and future years is actually attributable directly to wholesale lockdowns. And the rest of it is sort of would have been there anyway. Now, this is also a reason why in my ideal policy uh, making scenario, the Australian government would have controlled fear early on because it's the fear that makes people take those kinds of actions. 
of not going to the restaurants, not going to the cinemas, keeping their kids home, et cetera. Fear is so powerful. Once you, once you hook into it, you do change the trajectory of, of human social life and, and the economy along with it. Now, many of the costs are, however, more unseen um, and are going to be occurring over decades to come. One of them is certainly the long run costs of the sorts of bad habits that David was speaking about that both children and adults are getting into now. So children learning that it's, that it's not a good thing to go to their friend's house because they might get sick um, or learning that you know, it's better to be on the, the video games rather than playing outside. Um, these, these habits are a big part of what children take into adulthood and, and they fight them if they're bad, right? They fight, they fight to recover a, a more healthy way of living. And, and that causes costs in the future. Uh, similarly, the university students, which actually is a cohort I, I completely forgot from my cost benefit analysis, I just didn't include it. There were so many bits and pieces to try to, to flag, but I have a university student myself as, as my son, and he's now home instead of where he should be in Boston, uh, continuing his education. And so he's taking part-time classes uh, through the, the learning from anywhere policy that his university has. And in Boston, and then he's also doing a, a class at University of Sydney and hoping that it will transfer. I mean, it's all this disruption um, and the costs to the high school cohort right now, particularly the, the, the year 12s, is going to be huge. Um, so, so those kinds of costs will only be seen down the track. Um, similarly, there are, uh, David said, there's a very important component of all of these costs, which is that generally speaking, they will be regressive. So David's children, my children, are generally speaking going to be fine, even though they are having these costs, they're going to be okay. There are many children out there, the ones who don't have as many resources to fall back on, the ones whose, whose families have lost their jobs, or whose families don't have the, the mental resources or the emotional resources to be able to support those children. And they are going to be suffering more than any of the other children. And that is something that has not come out in, in so much of the, the rhetoric about saving lives and you know being safe. What about those families? What about the ones who are on the, on the bad end of the income spectrum, on the bad end of, of the social and economic perspective? Uh, spectrum. That, that is uh, an unseen cause because those people don't have voice, not because those costs aren't happening right now. Um, and I agree with all of the other things that David said. Um, if people would like to know uh, in more detail about all the different types of costs, I do refer them to my cost benefit analysis sketch that's, that's up on the Big Parliament website. Uh, yeah, I think we can probably post a link for that in the chat. And um, look, th thanks to the audience for all of your questions. We're, we're going to do our best to get back to, to as many of them as we can. Um, I just messaged Simon offline and he's happy to stick around for um, a little bit longer than we'd originally scheduled to uh, answer some of those questions. I think um, just before we come to you, Simon, I think just related to what Gigi was just saying, I did see a report yesterday that one in four Victorian families are um, experiencing difficulties buying healthy food. So I guess um, I know that's uh, an, an area of expertise that you've looked into quite a bit, Simon. So if you want to comment on some of the harms and, and maybe talk about that diet aspect a little bit. Sure, yeah. I mean, a lot of my work has been around diet and uh, particularly sugar and uh, refined starches. And that tends to be the cheap kind of junky food that people turn to when they're uh, restricted with funds. So I think that's a real problem. And obviously, like every other country in the Western world, Australia's got a major problem with diabetes and heart disease. And uh, it's uh, clear to me as an epidemiologist that sugar and uh, refined starches are, are playing into that. And you also see that, um, that people with metabolic syndrome, uh, so high blood pressure, obesity, um, risk factors for cardiovascular disease are doing badly from COVID. So I would have thought that that might have been something in the government's messaging was uh, trying to cut down on sugar and reduce some of these risk factors. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, I'm not an economist, so I'm not good with dollars, but uh, in New Zealand, we've seen 15 billion spent on uh, 
uh, wage subsidies. Um, so obviously there's a big opportunity cost there. Uh, we've seen unemployment go up. Uh, there's still wage subsidy going on. And I think it'll probably keep going until the election. And after the election, we're going to get a very rude awakening. Um, my childhood was spent in a family when my dad was unemployed for most of my childhood and it was awful and so that's been one of my biggest concerns over this is that we're really you know exposing children to this uh, kind of economic hardship that to me is epidemiologically unjustifiable. I think, um, I think David, you wanted to make a comment about the role of fear, just uh, sorry, coming back to some of what Gigi was talking about, the role of fear in um, the government's response and, um, you know, a little bit about how that's had an impact. Yeah, so, I mean, the government's really been ramping up the whole fear rhetoric recently and I don't know lots of people have got theories on why that is um, but uh, I, I wonder I'm not sure if um, Gigi and Simon have seen any of our advertising campaign in Victoria so it might be interesting to get your uh, reaction to it maybe if you haven't seen it I'll just show you now one of the ads but the, the messaging has switched to, to you know this virus doesn't discriminate, which seems crazy to me because it absolutely does discriminate, is my understanding. Um, but they're trying to get across the idea that um, young people get this and it's going to hurt you. Um, and I'll just show you now one of these ads and um, I'll be interested to see your reaction to that. Runny nose, it is. It is a really mild symptom. For me, that runny nose, it was absolutely the first thing that happened. It wouldn't have been any more than 12 hours later. I was on the couch with those really strong flu-like symptoms, the body aches, the chills, the fever. My lungs were struggling to keep up as well, and I ended up just collapsing to the floor. It's quite intense to feel the virus attacking your body so ferociously that even the most basic of things seem impossible. Going to hospital, obviously being COVID positive, it means that I have to go there by myself. It means that all those normal support networks that you'd have, they're gone. Being admitted to the COVID ward, it's quite scary. Just hearing people coughing, the people gasping for air, for me at that point was just terrifying because I knew that that was probably what was ahead. If you need the motivation to do the right thing, if you're still resisting all of this, think of those people that you care about most in this world and them not being able to breathe. Well, I feel guilty and scared now. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've actually seen that, Gigi and Simon. There's a whole series of ads like that, by the way, with all different demographics that they've um, managed to target. Uh, I don't know, Gigi spoke about managing fear earlier. They're certainly managing fear. I'm not sure if it's what you were talking about, though. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that doesn't, uh, the, the emotional reaction that that generates in me is frustration and, and anger and a sense of offense at the government, because that's, that's absolutely irresponsible. Um, as you said, the virus does discriminate. And essentially, the entire advertisement is a, a, an embodiment of a reaction with anecdote to a, uh, a knowledge that we should have of statistics. So I've had this problem occasionally when, when trying to communicate the story to you know, my friends and family and, and others um, is, you know, you say a statistic, like you, you know, your point of the deaths by age group, for example, um, on which there's you know, reasonably good data because deaths are generally captured, even if you forget about whether it's COVID with or COVID of, it's still reasonably well captured in most of the developed country um, peers for Australia. You look at deaths by age group and they'll say, oh, no, but I know a 27 year old, blah, blah, blah. So it's a reaction of saying, oh, there's an anecdote that goes against your story to a statement about an aggregate statistic. And that is an example of pre enlightenment thinking. That is an example of regression back to uh, you know, the reptilian part of our brain that says, oh, no, 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 but we need to be scared of this thing. This is the thing that we should be scared of. And oh, you know, that, that it can happen. It can happen. Sure, it can happen, right? There are plenty of diseases that discriminate, but not perfectly. 
you know, influenza is one of those. There will be some young people who unfortunately succumb to influenza as well. Um, and, and those kinds of facts, which we normally, you know, have at our disposal, have basically flown out of the brains of many of the people who talk about this. And, and that's been a very interesting and unexpected for me phenomenon. Um, I understood the fear response initially because, you know, fear is that, that, that emotion that shuts everything else down. And, you know, you're just focused on that one salient supposed threat. But the, the longevity of it has been amazing. And the, the extent to which it has just, this hysteria has taken on a life of its own and become the direction in which whole groups feel they must move in order to continue to feel part of the group. Uh, and you can see from the demonization that I've had and, and that you've had and Simon has had that um, you know, people are using that, that um, the group membership uh, stick to try to punish people. Who, who dare to have a different and, and I would argue more normalized perspective on this whole thing. So it has become about group loyalty signaling. It has become about fanaticism for the sake of the group and, and seeing being seen to toe the line. And it is not about post-enlightenment scientific thought anymore. And, and I honestly, I would love to see us get back to that, which is why I do these sorts of things. Um, but uh, I'm not a politician, so uh, you know, I, I would have to uh, consult or have encouraged the government to, to hire people who can actually understand that, that dynamic in a political context and counteract it with, with better messaging. Thanks, Gigi. Um, we have several people asking, so what's the plan then? What's the end game? And I do want to come back to that to close out this discussion. Um, I know Gigi has to leave at 3.15. We'll, we'll see if we can fit all the rest of it into the, the next 15 minutes. But there's a couple of um, questions that maybe are uh, quite important here. I'll go to Simon first, because there's lots of questions about specific things related to the disease and the treatment. Um, so one of them is around uh, alternative treatments. We've heard about hydrochloroquine, zinc being used in combination with that. A lot of people are now talking about um, ivermectin. Um, and I guess the other one is um, herd immunity. What might that look like and what role might T-cell immunity from other coronaviruses play into that? Could you maybe... Give us your views on um, the effectiveness and appropriateness of some of these alternative treatments and what herd immunity um, might look like in halting the spread of, of the pandemic. Sure. Um, well, a couple of things there. Yeah, the, the, the other treatments. Um, I did look this morning at some of the evidence around hydroxychloroquine, and which is an anti-malarial. It's been used for many years in the tropics. Um, I, I'm afraid all the big trials, well, actually, most of the, the biggest studies are observational studies with clinical outcomes, and they don't look convincing to me that it's, uh, it's, it's worthwhile. I mean, I think there needs to be more evidence and more trials, but um, the evidence is looking disappointing for hydroxychloroquine in terms of improving clinical outcomes. Um, uh, the zinc, uh, I haven't looked at. I know a lot of people are keen about the vitamin D theory. I know there's been big trials of supplementing vitamin D in New Zealand and that uh, the results with infection outcomes has been disappointing. Um, so I'm not a big fan of alternative treatments for COVID-19. Uh, um, uh, the other question was about herd immunity and how far away um, are we from herd immunity? I think you know, it's interesting, um, the theory of viral epidemics is that you sort of go from a, a very susceptible population and then you get infection and you start running out of susceptibles as people start to become infected and they recover and they get antibodies and they can't get the virus again. And then you get this sort of characteristic up and down curve. And that's what the models are based around and um, you know there's been some interesting discussion about for example 80,000 deaths in New Zealand were predicted from these models and uh, we only actually had uh, 22 in the event um, 
well, it's obviously still going, but it's unlikely to get to 80,000. Um, and, and one of the reasons why those predictions were so wrong, I believe, is that there was an assumption that we are all susceptible to the virus. And there's been a number of studies coming out showing that there's cross-reactivity between SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses. There's another four coronaviruses that cause um, what we call influenza-like illness, which is basically we used to not really care that much uh, about these coronaviruses. Um, but it turns out that they're likely to give us a level of protection. Um, I, I think some people have been disappointed with the antibody studies in some parts of the world that they don't show higher levels. And people have been uh, very focused on the 60% figure, which is uh, one minus one over R naught, which gives you the sort of proportion of the population that uh, needs to be protected. But I think it's becoming clear to me that uh, understanding immunity from coronavirus is, is a lot more complicated than just the antibody results show. Um, for example, I've seen studies from Germany that show that in a third of uh, seronegative, so negative antibodies um, for, for uh, COVID-19, a third of them have specific T cell responses to the virus. So it looks like they've had the virus in the past. There's some questions about how important those antibody responses are. And I'm not a specialist in that area, but I'm told that it likely confers some immunity. And I think in countries that have had a lot of cases and a big spike and a lot of spread of the virus, um, they're starting to get levels of immunity about 10 to 20 percent. Um, and presumably that gets boosted up once the T cells get uh, considered. So it seems that around 10 to 20 percent is what you need for um, herd immunity in a community. Unfortunately, New Zealand has banned uh, assessment of antibodies. So <laughs> Um, we're really shooting in the dark about what, what's happening. Obviously, I was hopeful that um, the majority of the community had got antibodies, that it was going to be like a uh, the swine flu situation. My belief is that long term, SARS-CoV-2 is going to become an endemic virus like these other coronaviruses like HKU1, um, you know, which pop up from time to time, I think there's probably going to be this big spike, uh, up and down spike as we get uh, immunity. And then there's, you know, a few other uh, secondary waves as um, the virus goes through other sub-communities uh, that haven't seen the virus yet. But eventually we're going to get to that critical herd immunity point and, and then the virus just keeps propagating through new susceptibles. And I think that's what's going to happen ultimately. I hope that's answered the question. Yeah, I think so. Thanks for that. Um, I'm just aware of the time and that uh, Gigi does need to leave soon. So I've got, I guess, one question and then um, I'd invite you to just um, maybe give your view about, you know, what the end game could look like, what alternatives could we possibly take? So. The question that came forward, and I'll ask um, David, you know, it was posed to David and, and Gigi, um, what safety measures have been employed to protect our economy? At the moment, we're only spending so far, and is there a time limit on that? So maybe if you want to tackle that question and then the, the bigger question about what the end game might look like. Well, I mean, people will speak of JobKeeper as a mechanism of protecting the economy. And if it was in place for a short period of time, I would agree. I was a big supporter of JobKeeper when it came through because my feeling was that if we are going to prevent businesses from operating for a period of time, what we really don't want to happen is for the, the links, the network links between those businesses and their employees, for example, and, and those businesses and their suppliers to break. And we know that links do break the longer the business stays idle. 
because those factors of production, the labor and the capital will find other uses, will find other places to go. And that then requires a whole uh, period of time in which people are looking for new partners to trade with or, or be employed by. And that's very costly in terms of human welfare. So I was a big supporter of JobKeeper for keeping those network ties in place. But of course, it's been uh, going on now for six months and uh, now going to be it's going to be in place until end of March next year at, at slightly lower levels still, but um, it's still there. And so this, in my view, is a kind of a kicking the can down the road sort of response. Um, yes, of course, we, we can do it. It's possible for the Australian government to do that. And I'm not as apoplectically uh, alarmed about the government debt as some people would be, but I am alarmed about the concept that somehow government paying people to sit around is just as good as the economy working and having those people get paychecks <laughs> in terms of human welfare. It's just not. I mean, we've, we've stripped from people the, the, the personal identity and the confidence and the, the sense of making a contribution that, that participation in the economy brings. And we've also basically stopped in its tracks any, any innovation, um, any sort of you know, pushing ahead of the, of the frontiers of human knowledge and whatnot that, that happen when you have a functioning economy and the discovery of, of, of you know, other goods and products and services that we could potentially produce, all of the things that, that economic health bring to us have been held back by this lockdown. And, and it can't be, those things can't be magically fixed by the government writing checks to every person who is now sitting at home. So, so it's just, it's, it's farcical really to think that that's a replacement, a proper replacement to, to uh, you know, the, the, the problem. Um, and I think the, the lack of understanding of that goes to, frankly, a, a, a very low level of economic literacy in this country and perhaps in New Zealand as well. People really don't understand how society works. And that's been a big um, a learning for me, a lesson that I've, I've taken from this whole experience is the extent to which people really don't get that. Um, so anyway, that's one thing. In terms of the end game, I mean, I think what should happen is that um, while early on the border closures, the international border closures were a good idea to give the healthcare system time to, to prepare and to give us a bit of time to learn, I don't think those closures should have been in place for more than probably a month or maybe six weeks. And, and we certainly should have them open now. And we certainly should have state borders open now. And we should certainly have people back at work. And we should certainly have kids back at school. What we should be doing is using our resources and our concern for, for you know, not losing people to this virus to be directed towards those places where the virus is most likely to be lethal. And this was spoken of earlier in this talk. Um, so look at how aged care facilities are run, possibly in New Zealand. It sounds like from what Simon said that they're doing a pretty good job there. Great, let's get on lower to the aged care facility people and the people working in that sector in New Zealand, figure out what they're doing and apply it here. Right? And we got to figure out how to protect people who are immunocompromised. How do you handle this in hospitals? The infection control protocols that, that other countries like New Zealand, perhaps, certainly Sweden as well, because they also messed up early on with the older people, um, that they've learned through this crisis, we can apply. And, this, and it would be, again, uh, unethical for the government not to be doing that, to be looking into how actually we can use these resources to protect the people who are the most vulnerable. Now, on the question of you know, when to socially distance or you know, in what exact, exact circumstances, I think the vast majority of people will take that, that, those decisions on their own. Um, whether there is actually any need for the government to come in and, and mandate certain things in a general sense, I, I, I'm dubious about. I think in terms of old age care and hospitals, there may still be a role, um, but there also may be a role in terms of regulation guidance rather than uh, mandating certain kinds of behaviors. So I think that's the only possible end I mean, about the, the herd immunity thing. That's always the way it was going to be, but people just didn't like to hear it. And, uh, and I think they're just increasingly going to have to face it. Great, thank you. Um, I believe Gigi probably has to leave us now. So um, thank you for joining us, for answering people's questions. Um, I know there's been a lot of great feedback in the comments. People appreciate you being here and giving an alternative point of view. Um, it's my pleasure and I appreciate the opportunity to speak and I'm, I'm quite happy to take other questions if people have them. Um, I'm easily reachable on email. Just Google Gigi Foster UNSW. Um, and also I put a link in chat to the cost benefit analysis that I um, referred to earlier, which is yeah. uh, also by a colleague of mine actually on a blog site, but it's also on the Vic Parliament website and I'm sure David can, uh, can forward that link as well. Thanks so much, Gigi. Thank you, bye.
and um, the rest of us will continue for a little while to, to get through maybe your last couple of questions and um, tackle this bigger question about what the end game might look like. So um, maybe I'll go to David first. Um, what, what's the alternative? If, if not hard lockdowns, then what? So I've been uh, critical for some time that the government hasn't been even attempting in most cases voluntary compliance with a lot of these measures. You know, the, the, the example that I've given many times has been around masks, but I think that there's lots of other um, things here that the government has just gone straight to um, mandatory everything and fining people and policing things rather than educating people about these things and how they might be useful. So, you know, masks is the classic case. Um, they have, um, you know, they're, they're, they're useful in certain situations. Um, they have limitations on their usefulness and they're not useful in certain situations. They need to be used a certain way. And, you know, and there's different types of masks that are useful for different purposes. And the government didn't really educate people about any of that. If you look at what they did in Japan, they never had um, mandatory masks, but they did have a big education campaign with videos and television specials and everything on, you know, here's what masks are good for, here's what they're not good for, here's when they're useful, um, here's the different types of masks and all of that sort of thing. We never had that in Australia. They just said, right, masks are mandatory from Wednesday night and if you don't wear one, you're going to get a $200 fine. Here's where you can go and buy one. And if you can't buy a mask, you can just get a scarf or a or a bit of fabric and put it around your face and you won't get a fine. Now, you know, I'm not a doctor. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Simon will have views on the effectiveness of that, but it doesn't seem like a very uh, effective means of educating people about um, uh, infection control to me. And that's just one example. And they've done that with everything. Like it's just fines, 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 fines. And um, that's not a sustainable approach. It totally depends on the emergency powers it's not something, you know, if something has to be done for a longer period of time, then there needs to be some sort of education and change in culture in order to achieve that. You can't rely on policing this forever, surely. Um, I'd be very interested to hear what uh, Simon has to say about that sort of thing. And I'm not sure exactly what they did in New Zealand about masks, and maybe they've got a different approach there. Yeah, well, it's been interesting. I mean, there's been some epidemiologists very keen to get uh, develop a masking culture, and I think they were discussing making it mandatory, as it is in Victoria, I believe, if you're outside. Um, but, yeah, uh, having had a look at the evidence on the mask thing, I mean, uh, I'm not a politician, and <laughs> all I just keep going back to is the evidence, and... Uh, even the WHO was they were saying masks are okay for um, protecting people who have symptoms, but not for healthy people um, to prevent them getting infected. Uh, and in, in terms of um, studies, there was a couple of big trials back in sort of early 2000s where there was this idea that we could give masks to people um, in families where there was somebody who had influenza, we'd give the rest of them masks. It just didn't work. It was very disappointing. And uh, I have seen some studies that are uh, quite supportive of masks in very confined spaces like aircraft. Um, but really outside of that, um, I'd, and I think they really ramp up the fear message um, as a sort of communication tool, which I am worried that the government will use masks as a way of increasing fear, um, um, and which is beyond their, the, the evidence uh, epidemiologically supporting the masks. I think in New Zealand, we saw early on that masks were not a big thing because the evidence was lacking. And then latterly, they've been thought of as being a big thing. And it's not because the evidence has changed. It's, I think it's because of that political advantage and the communication message it's, it sends in, in trying to get people to, to, to um, take on these these messages and accept um, the lockdown. Um, 
Dr. Thornley, a um, few people have asked. Uh, I think some people are more familiar with it. We do have a few New Zealand viewers there. So um, could you please explain for us what is Plan B, the, the group that you've set up, the alternative plan? What exactly is that in New Zealand? Uh, well, yeah, um, as I said, uh, I never really wanted to <laughs> form a Plan B group or any sort of group. Uh, it really came about after writing an op-ed being, I just felt compelled that I had to say something about what was happening, about being in lockdown. And then after that, a group of academics coalesced. Um, and we also had a PR guy who vol volunteered his time pro bono. And so we've just felt compelled to offer a an alternative um, path to dealing with the COVID um, uh, epidemic. So we we basically said we need to go back to work, go back to school, and we need to apply. Uh, principles of infection control around uh, the uh, frail elderly and so that's rest homes, hospitals uh, and get on with life basically um, and so we've been uh, a voice and basically trying to explain the scientific evidence to the public as it as it comes out we've We've recently done a seminar, a webinar online where we've looked at international voices. Um, you know, I've been uh, rather sidelined by my colleagues in, in New Zealand and uh, sort of the, uh, it's created this picture that it's, it's uh, everyone in New Zealand is on the, in the same boat as all the other epidemiologists are thinking the same. Um, but when you look globally uh, at some of the most experienced, um, best known epidemiologists in the world, you know, they're strongly advocating for a much more moderate response to the pandemic. So uh, the la latest webinar was really uh, trying to get some of these voices heard in New Zealand and, and get some media airtime for them. Great, thanks for that, Simon. Um, we probably do need to wrap up and I apologize to um, some of the people that we didn't get to your answers. There's uh, there's over 750 comments there and we, I've been doing my best to, to get to them and try and draw together some of the key issues. So I do apologize if we didn't get to your specific uh, question. We, we might go through the comments later and see if we can respond to them. Um, so I guess finally, David, um, What's next? And I guess uh, one of the questions that's come through uh, several times is um, what, what can people do? What can Victorians and people out in the community do if they aren't supportive of the lockdowns? Um, how can they ensure that they're heard and, and try and push for a change of policy? Yes. Um, so, like, what's next in Victoria is uh, we're going to come to the end of this uh, emergency declaration period and this is going to be a significant event one way or the other no matter what happens and um, you know whether the government tries to continue it or whether they try change direction or whatever we don't really know what they're going to do yet and I think this is one of the problems that we've got is the government really hasn't been very clear about what their plan is you know they haven't told us you know under what metrics are they going to ease things up and you know how long is this going to go on for and are they really you know we've asked things about you know are they waiting for a vaccine and you know they said well the plans don't depend on a vaccine but you know the plan sort of involves doing these lockdown yo-yo lockdowns for years which i just don't think is sustainable um but i think that's going to be the big fight will be in September will be this at the next sitting of parliament, I guess. And so what can people do? Um, so if you, a lot of people have already been doing this because I've had lots of people contact my office, but um, contact your members of parliament in Victoria, both in the lower and upper house. Um, maybe we can post a, a link if you're not sure how to do that. 
but you know you can contact them via email, via um, telephone. You can just call their office or um, via social media and tell them what your views are on on this sort of thing and whether you support extending this state of emergency or if you'd like them to take a different course. I mean, it's a democracy. Um, you're allowed to uh, voice your opinion to your elected representatives, and I would uh, urge you to to do that. Um, I would urge against, um, you know, uh, sort of using form letters and things like that. I think your own personal story of how things have affected you is much more effective uh, as a means of persuading someone rather than some sort of, you know, form letter template thing. And I think stick to the things that, you know, the government can actually do or they are actually doing. So, um, yeah, I think the emergency powers is a, is a big one that um, I'll be focusing on in the next few weeks. But, you know, what I'd like them to do is to focus more on voluntary measures and education for people on, you know, what what is the real dangers of the virus? How can people address this in their business and personal life in a, in a sustainable manner over the longer term? And I, I really love what uh, Simon's done in setting up a group um, I wish we had something like that in Australia, and maybe that's what we need to do in Australia, is to have a group of experts with alternative views on this. You know, I'm not an expert on these things. I'm just dealing with the political side of it. But it's it's wonderful to talk to people like Simon and Gigi who have expertise in those other areas and can provide um, real perspective on, you know, alternative views on this because everything's been presented by the government as if, you know, this is the only option. And I don't think that's true at all. There are many options. There's a spectrum of options, a spectrum of responses that the government could take. And um, it's entirely legitimate for citizens and experts to debate those and question whether the current response is the optimal response. And I'd be interested to hear what Simon has to say about that as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of lockdowns, looking at the evidence for lockdowns, it, <clears throat> it certainly, if you, if you look, compare states in the US that have locked down with those who, that haven't, uh, there's not a compelling statistical story to show in terms of benefit. Uh, and looking at New Zealand's uh, yeah, you can do what's called a time trend analysis, uh, looking at when we thought New Zealand's effective lockdown was going to hit and, and did it change from the uh, expected trajectory. And my analysis shows that we probably saved about 100 cases, which is, uh, translates to about one life um, in a frail elderly person um, so in terms of costs of lockdown uh, uh, Gigi's probably got the Australian figures to look at it but um, in New Zealand the government uh, estimated uh, government source anyway estimated that the costs outweighed the benefits 95 to 1 so in terms of other options, you know, we've been advocating for this um, protect the elderly, protect the frail, infection control, separating COVID cases from non-COVID cases, and really uh, getting on with life and, and realizing that uh, we need to dial back the fear um, that we've been sold. Uh, Obviously, the border is a complicated issue, uh, but even if you take the government's approach, which has been sort of a zero risk elimination approach, you know, there's, there's countries that have almost zero COVID now that you could easily open up to, even with the government's. Uh, uh, paradigm. Um, you know, obviously, I'm I'm arguing that we need to change the paradigm. Um, but you know, the it, it just seems to me that um, you know it is kind of binary thinking. It's it's you know, there's either no cases or we've got to lock down. Um, <laughs> It, it just doesn't bear, you know, most things in health are subject to a cost-benefit analysis. 
And all the cost benefit analyses that I've seen don't uh, show a favorable response to lockdown. So I think, you know, that's a clear message from the government is that, that we can't do this uh, indefinitely. And certainly what David's been talking about, the yo-yo lockdown thing, I think is just not sustainable from the uh, economic perspective. So, yeah, my, my, uh, I think the number one thing we need to be concerned about is capacity in the health system. If we've got capacity in the health system, uh, then we can we can easily open up and get back to work, get back to school. Uh, any final comments, David, or shall we shall we wrap it up? Yeah, look, I think that's a good place to leave it. And you know, I I I think that one thing that um, Simon and Gigi have both brought up, and I think is absolutely. Uh, something that we should be considering is this idea of focused protection. Um, you know, I feel like the government's just spread its resources so thin on everything when, and stuffed up the most important things, which seem to be, uh, you know, caring for people that are vulnerable to this disease and managing quarantine and things like that and infection control. Um, those things haven't been managed great. And um, I, I really like the idea that you know we can focus where we expect most of the harm from the disease to occur and and let everyone else get back to things as soon as possible i think that seems absolutely reasonable to me um but my main concern is that we need to have this discussion about the spectrum of responses you know and the, again like simon says this idea that there's a binary response you either do nothing or you lock everything down which, and, you know, there's no other choice just is totally wrong, I think. Any final thoughts, Simon? No, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a very good discussion. I guess one of the other interesting things that I've discovered recently is, you know, one of the scariest things in New Zealand is these discussions about elimination predicated on a vaccine in two years. Um, we've be, and been in discussion with a guy who's developing a vaccine in Canada. He says the world record for getting a vaccine to market is four years, most are 10 years. So holding out uh, for a vaccine, I think, has, has got to be something that we just let go of. It's, it's not a, a way out of this. And I think there's been a lot of hype. And, uh, you know, he himself, this guy in Canada, just says that it's actually compromising scientific integrity, the public and the government's expectations of him. Um, so, I, you know, that's a dominant narrative in New Zealand. I don't know what it's, it's like in Australia, but I, I, I think that's an important one that just needs to be put out to pasture. All right, I think we'll leave it there. So um, thank you everyone who joined us in Victoria and uh, in other jurisdictions. Thanks to uh, our guests, Professor Gigi Foster and Dr. Simon Thornley and uh, David Limbrick, uh, member for the Upper House in the Southeast Metro region in the Victorian Parliament, the Liberal Democrats. And um, thanks for all of your questions. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to the, the nut of your particular issue. We, we did our best to cover a range of things. Thanks to you too, Ash, for hosting and managing everything. Thanks. Right. Thanks, guys, for having me. Thanks a lot, Simon. Yes.